Hello, and welcome to our Katie University's Histology course uh, series on nervous tissues. And in this lecture, mini lecture, we're going to take a look at the glial cells or the support cells that are located within the nervous system. Now, if we take a look at the glial cells, again, from a historical perspective, the term uh, neuroglia uh, comes from Dieter's uh, about 1860. And this is basically neuro for nerve, glia for glue. And so this is the stuff, in essence, that was identified very early on as holding the nervous system together. And so uh, recognizing that these are uh, very small cells, uh, they're essentially cluster around and supporting the neurons, cluster around supporting the, the cells that are capable of sending these electrical and chemical signals within the body. And so the neuroglia, or more commonly called the glial cells, outnumber the neurons in some region by about 10 to 1. And so basically we're looking at uh, a number of cells in essence that because of their special characteristics are going to be involved with uh, maintaining the nervous system, maintaining these nerve cells, and establishing an environment for the proper functioning of, of the nerve cells, the, the electrical chemical signals. Now in most cases the neurons, or I'm sorry, the glial cells are going to be indistinguishable without special stains. So we may be able to identify them in general based on their location, but we can't define them uh, specifically and uh, with you know 100% accuracy without using some type of special stain. And so if we take a look at the glial cells within the central nervous system, what we're going to be looking at are basically four cell types. They're going to be the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, the microglia, and the ependymal cells. And so we're going to go through and take a look at each of these uh, in turn. Now the astrocytes are the largest of the glial cells. And so astro for star, cell, site for cell, they're going to be kind of star-shaped cells. So as we'd expect, they're going to have very long cytoplasmic processes. And again, in many cases, very branching cytoplasmic processes. So you can imagine that these cells, if we were to take a look at both the cell body and the processes, are going to look like little stars. And if we take a look at them, we're going to find that at the tips of these processes, or many of these processes, we're going to have expanded pedicels, uh, essentially petty for foot, uh, kind of cell for extension. Uh, we're going to have what are referred to as vascular end feet. And so the astrocytes are essentially going to go through and interact with the capillaries within the nervous system. And so they're essentially going to go through and wrap around these capillaries. And because of that, it was thought, at least initially, that the, the uh, sole purpose of the astrocytes was to regulate the, the blood vessels and to establish what's referred to as the blood-brain barrier within the nervous system. Now, with further study, we recognize that the astrocytes are going to be involved with a whole range of functions. And so if we take a look at this, and again, the, the diagram on the, the right-hand side is from Dieter's, uh, about 1865, looking at an example of an astrocyte. And so the original function was thought to be establishing and maintaining the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the nerve cells are going to be very, very susceptible uh, to pathogens, uh, to toxic substances, and the body has a limited ability to replace these cells, or at least replace their functions. And so if we lose nerve cells, generally, we're going to have some type of deficit associated with it. And so you want to have a good functional blood-brain barrier so you can minimize the, the toxic substances, the harmful substances that can get into and potentially kill off uh, these nerve cells. But more recently, it's been found that the astrocytes have a whole variety of other functions. Uh, they can be involved with feeding neurons. And again, this is related to the blood-brain barrier in that they're going to be involved with actively pulling glucose out of the bloodstream, so actively transporting glucose from the bloodstream into the nervous system environment, into the area where the glucose can then diffuse to these nerve cells, and essentially the nerve cells can use glucose as their primary energy source, uh, their food source in essence. Under some circumstances, astrocytes can influence the number of neuronal synapses. So again, establish the environment in which these nerve cells are going to be interacting with their targets for the sending of signals, sending and receiving of signals. Uh, under some circumstances, astrocytes can produce trophic factors. Uh, 
uh, in the previous mini lecture we talked about uh, neurotrophic factors, essentially factors that are picked up in the periphery, like in muscles, and transported back to the cell body, and uh, essentially tell the cell body something or direct the cell body, uh, the nucleus, to produce some type of protein or to do something. The astrocytes can do similar things, so essentially produce an environment that's conducive for the nerve survival. Uh, in some cases, uh, astrocytes, again, can sequester excess uh, neurotransmitters, such as glutamate. Uh, in other regions, it can actually be involved with the recycling of neurotransmitters. And so uh, the chemical neurotransmitter released by a nerve cell will diffuse across the space, and we'll talk about this in more detail uh, in the next or one of the upcoming mini lectures. Uh, but we want to be able to take that neurotransmitter out of that space so that another signal can be found. Uh, another signal can be sent from the sending cell to the receiving cell. Uh, astrocytes can be involved with regulating that, helping to recycle the neurotransmitter. Uh, glutamate is an example that at very high levels it could be toxic to cells. And so the astrocyte is going to be good at gobbling up the excess glutamate and again maintaining a nice, safe, uh, survivable environment for the neurons. It also appears um, that there is some intracellular flow of calcium between the astrocytes. Uh, so again, uh, calcium, as we're going to see later on, is going to be important for the release of the neurotransmitters, uh, but we want to regulate the amount of calcium that's within the environment. And so the astrocytes are going to be involved with regulating this. They can essentially uh, absorb the calcium and then release it as it's needed within the environment. The second of the, the neuroglia or glial cells within the central nervous system are going to be the oligodendrocytes. And the oligodendrocytes are the most numerous of the glial cells. And if we take a look at them, what we're going to see are going to be cells with a lot of processes that come out. And they're essentially going to interact with uh, the axons. Uh, so they're going to be occurring in rows along the axon. And the processes of the oligodendrocyte are essentially going to go out, wrap around the axon, or support the axon uh, by basically forming myelin. And uh, the oligodendrocytes uh, can have the ability to myelinate several related uh, axons, so several nearby uh, axons. Again, by their processes going out and essentially wrapping around their cell uh, membranes, wrapping around uh, the axon in, in multiple layers. Um, the next are going to be the microglia. The microglia are going to be the smallest and the rarest of the glial cells. Uh, if we take a look at them, they're going to have a, a fairly condensed nuclei, fairly short, thorny processes, relatively uh, difficult to identify under normal circumstances. But if you use a special stain or uh, like the antibody stains that we've talked about previously, you can go through and see these cells. Uh, there are going to be a few of these cells kind of scattered throughout the central nervous system under normal circumstances. But in areas of neuronal injury, uh, damage, uh, cell death, uh, the microglia are going to proliferate. They're also going to migrate to these areas because they have a phagocytic uh, ability. Uh, the microglia essentially uh, work very similar to what would be a brain macrophage. What uh, a macrophage is doing out in the periphery, going through uh, kind of cleaning up damaged regions uh, the microglia are going to be doing within the central nervous system. And the final of the, the glial cells within the central nervous system are going to be the ependymal cells. And the ependymal cells are going to be involved with producing cerebrospinal fluid. So we're going to find them lining the open spaces within the brain. And so the brain ventricles, the aqueducts of the brain, as well as uh, they're going to be found within the central canal, the spinal cord even though that uh, is often kind of filled in uh, in the, the adult individuals. Uh, but essentially lining the spaces um, within the brain um, in an, an adult or in a child. If we take a look at this, what we're going to see is going to be what appears to be a simple columnar epithelia. And so we take a look at it, we can see kind of cells that are taller than they are wide. Uh, we can see uh, processes. Uh, of these cells that essentially don't end at the what would be the basal lamina. And so as opposed to uh, a basal lamina uh, and a true epithelial cell where 
an epithelia would be anchored to it and not penetrate through the basal lamina into the surrounding tissues. These ependymal cells essentially have basal processes, basal again, the base of the cells, which extend down deep within the gray matter. And so because of that, uh, they resemble a, a simple columnar epithelia, uh, but they're not a, a true uh, epithelia. They're going to be uh, these epithelial, I'm sorry, epi epidem they're going to be these ependymal cells, uh, specialized cells, again, for producing cerebral spinal fluid. And so this finishes up uh, our overview of the glial cells of the central nervous system. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.